much. Um, I thought since I was first up, I'd continue the uh, general sort of scene setting for the rest of the session and make a few kind of observations about innovation and promotion of um, And I guess probably I could have time, time for this as well. Um, so, firstly, it's clear from the recent focus with in CIFA that innovation is happening planning all the way through the analysis and archiving the results. And the CIFA Innovation Festivals have showcased a wide range of innovation activity. And last year, an archaeological contractor, archaeological research services, won the King's Award for Innovation, which is a phenomenal achievement and a clear indication of the that we are an innovative sector. Secondly, I think we need to remember that innovations are only innovative for a limited duration. After that, they are either a shift idea that didn't work or become mainstream. Finally, much of our work is repetitive and quite formulaic by nature. Each week across the country, archaeologists are digging our trenches to verify geophysical survey results. Largely, this is a very effective uh, technique um, developed through many years of practice. And just think of the chaos that would ensue if everyone decided that on every individual our trenches project they needed to try some other innovative approach to evaluation and excavation. So I therefore suggest that we shouldn't expect and don't need innovation from hardwired. So to look at innovation and where it's taking place and what influences and drives that innovation, I've tried to map archaeological activities onto three main areas of innovation. And I've put them in a Venn diagram to make it kind of a triangle. Um, and I'm just going to kind of talk through this here as part of the presentation. So I kind of view on, um, externally driven developments as ones that innovate and generate, so influence and generate innovation in largely the non-intrusive and early site survey. So these include developments in LIDAR and other aerial remote sensing as well as geophysical survey. And I've drawn that box over kind of across into the commercial archaeological innovation because there's obviously lots of crossover going on there as well. Nonetheless, this is often a sector where archaeologists are the beneficiaries of developments made by others and the speed of innovation and knowledge transfer is largely governed by external factors. So take up LIDAR, for example. When it was first used in archaeology 20 years ago, you needed a fixed wing plane or a helicopter carry out survey. The initial resolution was adequate, but was obviously increased significantly. Now you can acquire LIDAR data from the drone, or even just acquire topographic data from the photos taken from the drone and processed through structural promotion. So in just 20 years, the field has completely changed, largely due to technology changes that have happened outside the sector. And that doesn't mean that there hasn't been a lot of development and evolution led by archaeologists as well, for example, in looking at how the data So this next image, hope what, what I'm showing is that there's an awful lot of archaeological practice where the innovation is driven by commercial archaeologists. In relation to project planning, for example, I think the way we all approach investigation is beginning to be more innovative. Um, and methods developed over the last 10 years are becoming much more mainstream. So for large sites, I would expect to see a program of geoarchaeology and deposit modeling as one of the first aspects of the investigation, perhaps even prior to geophysical survey. So this would help show which areas remote sensing work best in and where other approaches might be more appropriate. And a lot of this innovation has come out of long and slow development of ideas and quarry sites, from funding like the Agri Levy Sustainability Fund, and big urban developments along large area schemes. It starts as innovative and then as the approaches are adopted, they become more common. At this point I think it's almost that it's not the techniques that are innovative themselves, but the way in which they work together to maximise the effectiveness of non-intrusive surveys the main area of by way of further example of archaeological excavation and innovation, last month we had the publication of the Must Farm Pile Dwelling Settlement, which is free, uh, freely available for download, which is obviously itself an excellent innovation. Um, for me, another major innovation was the Must Farm Tent. Spending a sizable portion of the project budget on a site tent might seem like a large investment, but this is more than recouped back in staff time saved each morning and evening and covering up fragile and vulnerable remains um, and providing a large and stable extreme defending weather, which also allowed the team to leave much larger areas of the site open and help them better visualise it. And similar enclosures were used on HS2 for the excavation of three burial grounds, and this would undoubtedly part, be part of project planning discussions for any large complex sites. I think at the moment one of the largest drivers for innovation in commercial archaeology is the scale and complexity of the many large infrastructure projects that are taking place, requiring everyone to think about how to best identify investigating character as a huge amount of material that's encountered in these schemes. 
innovation is also being driven by requirements of CDN and health and safety, and as was discussed at the last innovation festival, issues like climate change and carbon net zero, where the sector is adapting to external climate. These big projects often bring together archaeologists and joint venture companies and other similar collaborative groupings. This helps to foster cooperation and collaboration between staff and different organisations, whether in project planning teams, field teams, or in post excavation, leading to the sharing of ideas, best practice, Additionally, these large schemes also require close work between operators and practice, consultants, local authority, and national agency operators, as well as the client. And I've seen firsthand how having input from these multiple perspectives helps to lead further discussion, co creation, and cross disciplinary work, which helps to refine innovative ideas and develop them further. Coming on to the final part of my event diagram, innovation relating to academic research, this fits really closely with post excavation assessment and excavation work through these scientific techniques that support and underpin specialist analysis. And here, particularly in newly developed, relatively newly developed disciplines such as biomolecular archaeology, there's lots of postgraduate and postdoctoral research developing and refining techniques. So I've just kind of put up a, an image of the Gartner hype cycle because it provides a really useful way of visualizing some of the issues that occur with new areas of research. If someone develops a new technique, everyone gets really excited about it and starts to use it. It turns out that the issues being studied are much more complex than first identified. More research is needed to iron out those issues before finding the method is a viable addition to our research methodology. And I feel some of the biggest challenges for commercial archaeologists will even know about these new developments. First, finding out what, where, about the work and what's happening, but also, secondly, knowing which methods are ready for deployment and which are still under development. Having recently been to the UK Archaeological Sciences Conference in York, where a lot of academic research has been discussed, be really positive benefits from building even stronger relationships between post education specialists and academic researchers so to help with knowledge transfer. I want to wrap up by talking about how new developments are shared across the sector. For innovations arising from commercial archaeology, one of the challenges for large and complex projects is the time it can take for all the results to come out because of the sheer scale and complexity. The movement of people between different parts projects does, however, help with this dissemination. It's great to see methods developed in one project being used for other infrastructure schemes. For smaller projects, the focus and purpose of reporting is usually on the result rather than the use of any new method or approach of search, which can also reduce the opportunities for innovation transfer. I think, on one level, whatever the reasons for the speed of innovation transfer, you need to have a certain amount of lag in development time to ensure effectiveness of innovation and to repeat enough time to suitable evidence to others that the innovation is viable. A good case in point is digital recording, which probably sits in amongst all three of these different innovation elements and has been at least 40 years in front. Perhaps we could pick up in some of the reasons why even now digital recording is ubiquitous across all of the projects in the discussion session of the presentation. It's a really good example of risk and reward. One way the sector captures and shares best bits of innovation is through standards and guidance. For example, the historic kingdom from the digital archive might be seen for a man forced to complete ventures in India, such as the dig digital resources and talk on the Standards of guidance for the archiving of digital material have been around for some time, so having a digital management plan really shouldn't be an innovation at this point, but it still is a standard practice across all our organizations. Therefore, spreading the word and producing resources to help people understand how to make this transition is really important. Equally, the historic England scientific guidance document capture techniques that have been developed and tested over time, drawing on the knowledge and experience of the guidance authors, but also, and importantly, through the consultation process with the wider sector, another excellent example is co-creation. Since I lead a team of Historic England Science Advisors, it would be remiss of me not to highlight the key role that we play in sharing innovation through our engagement and involvement with commercial archaeological projects we get as an advisor. And finally, of course, conferences like this are a great way to spread the word, and for me, I think we've now reached the point where we can shift the narrative from worrying about whether or not we're doing this innovation to a position where we can just enjoy the chance to talk about our new and innovative practices. And that doesn't mean that I think we should stop doing innovation festivals because I think having that focus um, has been really useful in supporting new innovative approaches. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more about the new techniques in the session after coffee. But I think equally it would be good to see innovation integrated into some other conference sessions. One of the best sessions I attended at a recent season conference in the 
15 sessions of Brighton, because you really got to see the whole range of innovation applied like across the project life cycle. And personally, I'd love to see some more of those types of sessions that generate innovation, post-exploration.